Okay, thank you. I'd like to thank our hosts and, and also the people of India for having the Strings Conference here and, and also the organizing committee for the opportunity to give this talk. Uh, the talk will be based on work done in collaboration with spectacular collaborators, Clay Cordova and Thomas Dimitrescu. And I've uh, learned a ton from working with these guys over the last year, both on this project and also on some projects that are still in progress. So the topic of the talk will be, oops, the topic of the talk will be the conformal anomaly A. So if we look in even space-time dimensions at the trace of the stress tensor in a conformal field theory, uh, in flat space it would be zero, but on a curved space it's non-zero, and it's given in terms of some combinations of the curvatures. One of the combinations of the curvatures is the Euler density, and its coefficient is A, and that will be the star of, this, of today's talk. And then there's some other terms involving the violet curvatures to some power with some coefficient C that I won't discuss further today. So in two dimensions, A is unfortunately called C. Uh, in two dimensions, there's no, none of these Cs. And as was shown a long time ago by Sasha Zemlazhikov, it counts the number of degrees of freedom of a quantum field theory. So as we coarse grain and go from the UV to the IR, this quantity is some kind of height function which decreases. And also it's positive, uh, bigger than or equal to zero for any unitary theory. And it's only zero if the theory is gapped. In four dimensions, Cardi uh, conjectured that the same uh, properties should hold for the same quantity A. Uh, and there were many works after that by Osborne who explored this in perturbation theory and wrote down the candidate A function. And in su supersymmetric theories, this quantity A turns out to be related to the R symmetry of Tuft anomalies, as was shown by Anselmi, Friedman, Grissaro, and Johansson. And this is a very powerful connection which allows a, uh, the A anomaly to be calculable even in interacting theories using the power of a Tuft anomaly matching. And this led to many checks of the A theorem. And finally, there was a recent proof of the A theorem by a dilaton four-point function by uh, Kormogodsky and Schwimmer. Now we could ask about the, the six-dimensional version of the A theorem. The, the topic of the talk will be in six dimensions. And in the non-supersymmetric case, as I'll review, the dilaton analysis was inconclusive. Um, on the other hand, as, as we know, there are many, as we heard uh, also in the earlier talks, there are many examples of six-dimensional interacting superconformal field theories. Uh, it's not known whether or not there are non-supersymmetric um, well-defined examples. And so we can ask, what is the, the A for these, these many different theories? Also, we could ask about renormalization group flows in six dimensions, and in, in a separate uh, paper that's in the works with Clay Cordova and Thomas Dimitrescu. Um, it, and also, I, I should mention that there's a, uh, an overlapping work by Jan Louis and his student, uh, Severin Lust, who's, whose father is here in the uh, audience, uh, which is to appear. Uh, Six-dimensional conformal field theories can't have any supersymmetric Lorentz invariant relevant or marginal operator deformations. So there aren't any supersymmetry preserving RG flows in the usual sense. Uh, but we can deform the theories still. We can deform the theories by going on the moduli space. So we give expectation values to some of the fields, spontaneously breaking conformal symmetry. And then we can ask for these kinds of flows, what's the change in A? And is, is the change in A positive? OK, so just to briefly review the, the dilaton analysis. Um, so when we spontaneously break super, uh, conformal symmetry, the dilaton has derivative interactions to give the, the change in A and anomaly matching, as was first pointed out by Schwimmer and Thiessen and extended by Kermogodsky and Schwimmer. And in, in the six-dimensional case, the dilaton effective action looks roughly like this. Um, so there's, there's a kinetic term for the dilaton. This is the dilaton field. There's a four-derivative term with some coefficient b. And then there's a six-derivative term whose coefficient is delta a. And, and here I'm being a little bit schematic with the derivatives. There's the, the way that they actually are is more complicated, but the important point is that this is a six derivative term with six dilatons. And this was explored by Maxfield and Sethi and by Elvang, Friedman, Hung, Kiermaier, Myers, and Thiessen. Uh, I think I'll refer to this from now on as Elvang at, at all, so apologies to Rob. Um, so 
when you look at, at the four dilaton scattering um, to order momentum to the fourth, uh, to these uh, four derivatives, then um, as in four dimensions, unitarity uh, arguments show that this quantity B should be positive. And it can only be, uh, only free theories have a zero value of B. Uh, so this B has some nice positivity property, but B isn't the quantity that we're interested in. The quantity that we're interested in is delta A. So the, the physical significance of B seems to be unclear, and there was no conclusive restriction on the sign of this six derivative term, on this delta A. But, but a clue in both of these papers was that for the case of the two zero theory on the Coulomb branch, actually delta A happens to be B squared. And so in Maxfield and Sethi, this was shown by using 2-0 supersymmetry. And in Elvang et al., uh, it was noted that there's some zero amplitudes in that case, which fits with ADS-CFT for the case of the 2-0 theory. OK, a long-standing hunch, which, which for example appeared in the paper of Harvey, Menezes, and Moore from 1998, was that the super, there should be some supersymmetric multiplicative anomalies. It should be possible to relate the conformal anomaly A to a hoof type anomalies for the superconformal R symmetry in six dimensions, as was the case in two dimensions and four dimensions. So the idea is that the stress tensor is in the, sa in the same supermultiplet as an R current. Uh, for the two zero case, the R current is an SO5 R symmetry, and for the one zero case in six dimensions, which, which will be my focus, it's a SU2 R symmetry. And so because these are in the same supermultiplets, we could imagine that uh, their correlation functions ha satisfy some relations. And we can also look at the theory with sources, so we can turn on some background metric source for the stress tensor, and some background gauge field source for the R symmetry gauge fields, and also try to phrase the, this multiplet of anomalies in terms of relations when the sources are turned on. If we think about the, the case without the sources, then A in six dimensions is related to some four-point functions of the, some four-point function of the stress tensor. Uh, actually, it should be related to some four-point function of the stress, stress tensor, and, and surely it is, but to make that uh, concrete is, is extremely difficult because there's so many indices here and so it becomes very difficult to isolate A. Um, and, and also, in, aside from just uh, isolating A, just to compute this four-point function in general would be hard. But we could hope that this is related by supersymmetry to another four-point function which is related to the anomalies in uh, six dimensions. And this four-point function is easier because uh, the anomalies appear with very specific uh, Lorentz indices. Um, it's, it's easier to isolate the anomaly term, and also it enjoys anomaly matching. OK, so just to review, um, the, what we'll be interested in in six dimensions is, is the anomaly polynomial. And in general, in D dimensions, uh, we can write the anomaly polynomial in terms of a D plus two form. And so here we'll be discussing a, an eight form. And um, in general, this anomaly polynomial can be built out of both the gauge fields, um, characteristic classes for the gauge fields, and also pieces involving uh, the uh, background metric for gravity and background gauge fields for the global symmetries. So these pieces involving the gauge fields should, be, uh, should cancel for the theory to not have gauge anomalies. So this restricts the gauge group and the matter content. And then the pieces involving uh, the metric and the global symmetries, these are our analogs of the Atuft anomalies. So this is, this is what we'll be interested in. They satisfy some matching relations and that makes them very useful. So just to give an example, if we look at the, the two zero theory, then um, we can label its anomaly polynomial by the ADE group G. It has one piece which, which is, um, so here R of G is, is the rank of the ADE group. And this is basically uh, a free piece. This is exactly what you would have if you went on the Coulomb branch and just had R free tensor multiplets. And then there's another piece which is an interacting piece, which in this case involves the second Pontryagin density of, of the SO5R symmetry with some coefficient K of G. And this K of G was uh, calculated a long time ago by Harvey, Manazian, and Moore to be n cubed minus n. Uh, so this is for the case of the SUN20 theory. And um, 
the generalization for general ADE 2 0 theory is that this coefficient k of g is the dual Coxeter number of, of the ADE group g times the dimension of the group. And um, just to mention the, the work of uh, uh, the chairman of the session, uh, one way to understand this, um, this number, the, the dual Coxeter number times the dimension of the group, is by uh, gluing together two y vertices. And this gluing together of two y vertices, each of, each of which is uh, related to the, st the structure constants of the ADE group, this gives a way to see that this quantity here is related to a square. And so I'll, I'll come back again to this fact that it's related to something squared. If we consider the 2 0 theory on the Coulomb branch, for example, if we look at m, uh, n m5 brains and we pull one far away, so here we have n minus 1 5 brains and one lone 5 brain far away. So the position of this 5 brain uh, is given by the expectation value of a, of a 2 0 tensor multiplet. And so this, the fields in this 2 0 tensor multiplet, there are five scalars, which are the Dilaton and the Goldstone bosons for the broken R symmetry. And then there's the self dual two form gauge field and some fermion partners. And the Goldstone bosons have some interactions to match the Etuft anomalies. So in particular, uh, this coefficient k has to be matched. And this way of matching the Etuft anomaly shows that the change in this k is related to something squared. And this is similar to what was also, to what I mentioned that was found uh, in this analysis about the um, change in A from the Dilaton analysis, that the change in A is related to some quantity B squared. So this suggests that there could be some supersymmetric relation between these two. And there were some initial puzzles. And this was recently very nicely explained and resolved in a paper by Clay Cordova, Thomas Dimitrescu, and Sheehan. And what they showed in this paper was, in the end, was that the, the A for the two zero theories can be written this way. So it's the same quantity, the, the dual Coxer number times the dimension of the group, some coefficient, and then this is the rank of the ADE group. And um, the way that this was done was to relate the change in A to this change in K. And this also gives an independent calculation of the change in K being related to this quantity. Okay, so, so we consider one zero supersymmetric theories. And again, um, these theories don't have marginal or irrelevant deformation, so we deform the theory by moving on the moduli space. And the moduli space of one zero theories looks like this. There's a Higgs branch um, where some hypermultiplet gets an expectation value. And on this branch, the SU2 R symmetry is broken. The Dilaton and the Goldstone bosons together for, form a hypermultiplet. And then there's a tensor multiplet branch where the SU2R symmetry is unbroken. And then at the origin, there's the superconformal field theory, which is our starting point. So we start here, and we can move in either direction. And the analysis is much easier on the tensor branch because of the fact that the R symmetry is unbroken. So this simplifies things, and I'll stay on the tensor branch for the rest of this talk. We have some results for the Higgs branch, and we're also uh, further considering it. So that's in progress. So if we look at the uh, Etuft anomalies, th this, is, uh, this, was, uh, this also appeared in Jonathan's talk. Um, so the Etuft anomalies for the theory at the origin has some pieces that involve the R symmetry, um, the characteristic class for the background R symmetry gauge field. Uh, this is for the background metric. And again, this is for the background, background metric and background metric. So these are the pieces that involve the R symmetry and the metric, which, which is what we expect to be related by supersymmetry to uh, the conformal anomaly A. So the theory is characterized by these coefficients, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. And these coefficients, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, were recently computed for many 1, 0 superconformal field theories in this very nice papers um, by Omori, uh, Shimuzi, uh, Tachikawa, and um, another paper with Yokura, and there were many other uh, extensions of this, and we heard about some of these from Kumaran and, and from Jonathan. So for example, for the theory of n small E8 instantons, uh, they showed that these coefficients alpha, beta, gamma, delta take these values. So the leading uh, term in large n, this leading n cubed coefficient, so here this coefficient alpha has a leading coefficient, which is n cubed, and then there's some subleading n squared piece and order n piece. 
the fact that this coefficient alpha goes like n cubed could be an anticipated from the z2 orbifold of the 2, 0 case. Thank you. Uh, okay. So if we look at the theory on the tensor branch, then um, we have to satisfy the condition of a Tuft anomaly matching. So these coefficients alpha, beta, gamma, delta should, should be matched as we move away from the origin. But in fact, when, when you compute the theory away from the origin, you find that there's some difference. But anyway, the Tuft anomalies have to match, and the way they end up matching is that this difference should be something which is a perfect square. So the anomaly polynomial is an eight form, and this difference should be the square of a four form. And if it's the square of the four form, then it can be matched by a Green-Schwartz-West-Segnati type mechanism involving the, the B field. So what happens is that this, this four form becomes a source for the B field, and then th that ends up matching this, this difference. And so the Atuft anomalies still match. And in general, this four form can have some coefficients. Uh, so this four form, it's built out of um, the second turn class for the R symmetry gauge field and the first Pontryagin class for the, the background curvature with some coefficients x and y. And these coefficients x and y are some real coefficients. And uh, then this difference in the anomalies tells us that the change in a, the change in alpha, beta, gamma, delta has to take this form. Delta can't change at all. Delta was the coefficient of an irreducible term, which can't be matched in this way. So the change in delta is zero, and the change in alpha, beta, and gamma are given in terms of this x and y by this perfect square form. And there's some ugly coefficient, but it's basically just saying that it's a perfect square. So the plan is to show that one zero supersymmetry implies that uh, the change in A uh, just by using one zero supersymmetry is, is proportional to B squared, exactly as in the two zero case. This looks like the, an ugly coefficient, but it's actually the same, uh, same coefficient really as in the two zero case, just with some different normalizations conventions. And also that this coefficient uh, B that entered in the dilaton analysis is related to these coefficients x and y in the change in the anomaly polynomial. Okay, so, so first to show that the change in A is proportional to this B squared. So again, the, the dilaton uh, low energy effective action looks like this. And um, B is the coefficient of the four derivative term. The delta A is the coefficient of the six derivative term. And we want to su supersymmetric complete this to, to make it one zero supersymmetric. So on the tensor branch, the dilaton is the scalar of the tensor multiplet. And so our basic ingredient is that scalar together with the two form gauge field whose, whose field strength is self-dual and the fermions. And what we show is that um, all of the supersymmetric interactions on this tensor branch must be D terms. So they have to be something where it respects all eight supercharges because it's eight supercharges acting on some other operator. And um, there's no other way to make something that's Lorentz invariant and, and respects the supersymmetry. So then the, what we can do is we can try to, f to find what are this, what's this operator O that corresponds to B and delta A. And so here we're working in some derivative expansion and the, the counting in the derivative expansion is the usual kind of derivative counting where uh, fermions count as a square root of a derivative so our basic ingredients are the dilaton field, the fermions, which like the supercharge counts as like a square root of a derivative. We can form derivatives. Here I put in the fact that we're writing the derivative as having two spinner indices. The field strength for, for this two form uh, gauge field B, we can write as, um, as, as having two spinner indices which are symmetric. And this counts in the derivative expansion as, as like a derivative to the first power. So if we want something that's, that's a four derivative term here, uh, then this operator, since Q counts as like a square root of a derivative, this operator O should have no derivatives. And so we can supersymmetric complete the four derivative term by saying that it's Q to the eighth acting on something with no derivatives. So that's the B term. Now when we, uh, okay, so the B term we can get this way. But now when we try to look at, at the six derivative term, we see that we can't, in fact, supersymmetric complete it in this way. When you try to write down um, something like this that, that gives a six derivative term, since the q to the eighth already counts as having four derivatives, this O should, should count as having two derivatives. 
And if you try to write down something which, which has two derivatives, you just find that everything vanishes one way or another. And so there's no supersymmetric completion of, of this six derivative term. So the only, but we, on the other hand, we know that it's there. And so the only way that it can be there actually is that it's induced by the supersymmetric completion of, of the B term at quadratic order. And, and this is kind of a non-renormalization theorem that this delta A has to be related to B squared. And it's the relation between delta A and B squared is complete, should be completely independent of the theory. Uh, there's just some universal relation between them. Thank you. So the relation between them uh, in our normalization conventions is that it, it's, it has this ugly prefactor, but it's basically delta A is B squared. And this is the same relation that, that happened in, in the two zero theory. So this proves that these, these flows have positive delta A. So it proves the A theorem for these flows. And also, just to remind you, uh, this coefficient b is, is positive as, as, as long as the theory is interacting. Okay, so now we could try to supersymmetric relate the anomalies. And so, uh, just to repeat what, what was on the earlier slide, uh, to match the R-symmetry anomalies, we have this Green-Schwartz type, uh, Green type term with some coefficients x and y. And, um, on the other hand, in the, in the um, well, w w what we argue is that by supersymmetry, this is related to some curvature squared terms where these coefficients x and y appear in terms of the curvature squared terms like this. And, and actually here, it, we were very fortunate that the, the work was already done in a paper from 1986 by Bergshoff, Salam, and Sezgin. And so they showed that, that these two, um, they were looking at, at R squared supergravity. And so they wrote down uh, in R-squared supergravity some supersymmetric Lagrangians, and it follows from that, that that supersymmetry relates these terms. So this implies that this coefficient b, oops, this implies that this coefficient b of, of the four derivative term uh, is related to x and y, which was related to the change in the anomalies. So in the end, what this gives us is that the change in, in a is uh, this coefficient b squared, which we can write in, in this way in terms of the change of these, these Atuft anomalies. So this proves the A theorem for the tensor, tensor branch flows, and it relates the conformal anomaly to the Atuft anomalies. And we can generalize this very easily to theories with more tensors. For example, if we look at the theory of n small e8 instantons, uh, there are n tensors, and exactly the same kind of argument goes through. And um, what we get in the end is that the theory at the origin has some anomalies, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. This delta um, can't change because it, there's no matching mechanism. It has to be constant on the space of vacua. And the change in, in A is related to the change in these alpha, beta, gamma, delta. And so from that, we can see that, that the value of A at the origin, well, it's consistent to say that the, the value of A at the origin is um, this combination of alpha, beta, gamma, delta, or sorry, alpha, beta, and gamma, and then the value of delta we can fit basically by comparing with a free hyper or free tensor multiplet. So this thing in the, in the box is the main result. It gives the A anomaly in terms of the Atuft anomalies. So now that we have, have this result, we can apply it to different cases. So for example, we can look at the theory of n small e8 instantons, uh, as I mentioned, the, the values of alpha, beta, gamma, delta for this theory was, was worked out by this group. And so we can plug that into this general formula, and we get uh, this value for, for A. Uh, so, so A is some term, N cube term, which could have been anticipated by a Z2 orbifold of the 2, 0 case, and then some other terms. And this is also being considered uh, in the context of string theory by Heckman and Herzog. Okay, and we can also look at theories with vector multiplets. And here there, there are some subtleties. So a free vector multiplet in four uh, above four dimensions is a unitary, um, let's call it SFT, a scale but not conformally invariant theory. One minute, thank you. And it, it's also a subsector of a non-unitary CFT. So there was a nice discussion in this, in this paper of Elshok and Nakayama and Richkov. But if we, if we blithely anyway apply our relation between A and the Atuft anomalies to the Atuft anomalies for a free, uh, Fermi, for a free vector field, a free one zero vector multiplet, 
we get a value of a, we, well, we get this value of a, which is negative. So, so the fact that it's negative maybe doesn't look good because we expect a to be a height function that counts degrees of freedom. But on the other hand, this isn't a conformal field theory, or we could think about it as a subsector of some non-unitary non conformal field theory. So maybe the fact that it's negative uh, is okay. Zero minutes, okay. Um, but, but anyway, the, the, the free case isn't that interesting. It, 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 these theories can be embedded. Well, we could look at unitary interacting theories from vectors and tensors, both with a kinetic term that couples the tensor multiplet to the gauge fields and some specific matter to cancel the anomalies. Uh, this was pointed out a long time ago by Nadia Seiberg. And there are many examples like this. And so we checked in, in these different examples that the theory at the origin of these conformal field theories has a positive value of A. On the other hand, the theory of the t on the tensor branch, which is a, a scale but not conformally invariant theory, has some negative values. Okay, so just to conclude, there's a SUSY relation between A and the R symmetry in gravity at Hooft anomalies by uh, the, looking at the theory on the, on the tensor branch. There's lots of new data from this. We can now have the A values for one zero superconformal field theories. This proves that the 60, uh, the, the 60 A theorem is satisfied at least for these tensor branch deformations because the change in A is a perfect square. And uh, also the Higgs branch checks in examples and a proof of this for the Higgs branch is under study. And um, in terms of the positivi positivity of A, we don't have a proof of that, and it's not obvious with vector multiplets. So, thank you. Any question? <coughs> yeah, so you determine the relationship between delta A and B by using supersymmetry. Presumably, you could, you could also have determined it by using conformal symmetry, right? Yes. The, the broken conformal symmetry. Is that, uh, that would be an alternative <coughs> method that could also be valid in non-supersymmetric non theories? Uh, I, I don't know if delta A, if delta A is B squared in non-supersymmetric theories. Um, yeah, I, I don't, also I don't know if there are any interacting non-supersymmetric conformal field theories. Yeah, of course, but yeah, those two terms in the Lagrangian are related by, by the conformal symmetry. I see. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's more general than supersymmetry. Thank you. So uh, regarding the point here, positivity of A, have you tried to check all the, exam all the examples which we think is a classification of these theories to see if all of the things are positive or not? We checked many, we, we checked some examples. We, we didn't do a very thorough check, but we, the ones that we checked had positive A. <coughs> but it, it looked to be like a non-trivial non requirement or, or fact that it turns out to be true. So any more questions? Otherwise, let's thank the Ken again. Thank you.